and then we look here, it looks like because the Zen schools of Huineng in the south and Shen Zhu in the north, because they existed side by side, there was, became a strong rival feeling, like a rivalry. Like they little compete between each other. And the two masters themselves were not concerned about this, and they both worked selflessly. They both really tried just to help their students. But the followers, they, especially the followers of the northern school, uh, they called their own teacher the Shen Tzu, the Sixth Patriarch. And they were jealous of the robe. You know, remember we hear about the Hui Neng got the robe. He got the robe of the Buddha. Not this one that I'm wearing, but <laughs> he got the golden kasa of the Buddha. You know, and uh, the other monks were jealous. They didn't their teacher don't, didn't have the golden robe, but he had the golden robe. This is a problem, <laughs> OK? But because of this, they sent a certain layman who was a practitioner of martial arts. His name here in Chinese, Zhang Jin Chang. I'm not very good at Chinese. But he was a protect, practitioner of martial arts. They sent him to kill the Sixth Patriarch. Assassination. You all know what assassination is? What is it? Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. They sent him to kill the Sixth Patriarch. And the Patriarch have a psychic power. His mind is very sharp. So he already knew that this man was coming in to kill him. He already understood somebody was coming to kill him. And so what did he do? So uh, before the man come in, he took 10 towels of gold, 10 tails of gold. That means 10 gold coins, gold coins. And he put them beside his seat. And then the assassin came into the Patriarch's room. And the Patriarch is not afraid. He put his neck out like this. He showed his neck. Oh, yeah, you can kill. Try to kill me. But the assassin could not kill him. Even the assassin tried, he cannot cut his neck. Why? That's very strange. The assassin, maybe uh, he was looking at the gold, or maybe the sixth patriarch, his power, stopped him from kill, getting killed. Then the sixth patriarch said three times with his sword. Three times he tried to kill with his sword, but cannot kill him. Then finally, the patriarch said, the correct sword is not crooked while a crooked one is not correct. So your sword, something's not correct. Your sword has a problem. I owe you only money, but a life I do not owe. Wow, that's very interesting. So I only owe you money. I don't owe you a life. And nowadays, people's minds are very, uh, they're very scared, you know, and they have very little wisdom. So maybe somebody come in your house and try to kill you, or try to take your money. Don't take my money, don't take my money. Ah, then you get hurt. If somebody tried to kill you, uh, then give them your money is the correct thing to do. Already Six Peter understood that. He said, I owe you some money, but I don't owe you my life. Which is more valuable, the money or the life? Huh? Life is more valuable, of course. But he understood that maybe from the past karma, he owed him some money. So he put that money next to him. Self. Then it says here the shock. 
the shock of this teaching was so much for the Zhang, he fainted. And after he fell down, huh, he lose consciousness. He's so shocked. He cannot cut the neck of the sixth patriarch, and he's so shocked. And then when he was uh, awakened, he asked for forgiveness. Oh, please forgive me. He's very remorseful. And he asked the patriarch if he could become a monk. And the patriarch gave him the money. He gave him the 10 pieces of gold. And he said, you should leave now, quickly, because my followers might want to hurt you. And Zhang left. And after leaving the patriarch, Zhang became a monk and proved to be very diligent. So this is a very interesting story. Because he tried to kill the sixth patriarch, because of this inyan, we say karma or inyan, later, and he failed, he cut his own hair and become a monk. There's many stories like this in Buddhism. We hear this. But this is a very uh, good example of how the sixth patriarch, his wisdom is a very strong. His wisdom is so strong, the, nobody can kill him. Instead, those who try to kill him, they end up becoming his student. Then this Zhang left and became a monk. And later, uh, he remembered what the patriarch told him. This is much later. Much later, he remembered what the patriarch had told him, and he went to pay his respects. And the patriarch said, why do you take so long to return? I've been thinking of you for quite a while. And he said, I want to thank you for forgiving me. And I believe the only way to repay my debt is to, by spreading the Dharma for the benefit of sentient beings. I've read the uh, Nirvana Sutra many times, but there is one part I don't understand. What is the meaning of permanent and impermanent? What is impermanent is Buddha nature, replied the patriarch, and what is permanent is the discriminating mind together with all its good and bad dharmas. Your explanation, sir, contradicts the sutra. So what the sixth patriarch said is actually opposite of what the sutra said. You know, the Nirvana Sutra says that the Buddha nature is permanent, and the impermanent is the changing mind. But what the sixth patriarch, patriarch said is the Buddha nature is impermanent, and the changing mind is permanent. <laughs> this is a, a very a uh, little tricky point to understand, a little difficult to understand, because uh, the six patriarch teaching is all about the mind. Already I told you, his whole teaching, beginning, middle, and end, is about the mind. So everything he always talked about was the mind. That's why when the six patriarch came upon the two monks fighting about the flag, is it the flag moving? Is it the wind moving? He said, no, it's the mind moving. So his whole teaching was about the mind. But some people say the sixth patriarch also was attached to mind. So we have to be careful when we read about what he said not to get attached to mind. That's not uh, so good, to attach to mind. So what he said is in, what is Impermanent is Buddha nature. And your explanation contradicts the sutra. I dare not, since I inherit the mind seal of the Lord Buddha. He said, I cannot contradict the sutra. I am the Buddha's, you know, Dharma heir, the heir of the Buddha. And according to the sutra, the Buddha nature is permanent. While all good and bad dharmas, including the Bodhi mind, are not permanent. So the monk was very confused. He said, your explanation has intensified my doubt. And then the six patriarch explained, and his explanation still was uh, 
uh, not sufficient. And finally, he said something interesting. He said, if you look here on page where it says 8.11, 8.11, page 236, 8.11, he says, don't you understand if Buddha nature is impermanent, if Buddha nature is permanent, if the Buddha nature is permanent, why would the Buddha have to teach about good and bad dharmas? That's a very wonderful teaching. If Buddha nature was permanent, we do not need to learn about the dharma, about good and bad dharmas. If Buddha nature was permanent, then we would all be permanently enlightened. But we are not all permanently enlightened. So Buddha had to teach about good and bad dharmas, have to do many things like that. Okay? That's the point. The Buddha nature cannot be permanent. So he says, therefore, when I say impermanent, it is exactly what the Lord Buddha meant when he said permanent. <laughs> so, this is a contradiction. Permanent and impermanent, these are opposite words. If all dharmas were impermanent, then everything would have its own nature, which would suffer birth and death. In that case, true nature, which is truly permanent, would not pervade everywhere. Therefore, when I say permanent, it is exactly what Lord Buddha meant by truly not permanent. Okay, so here we see the uh, opposite, opposite words. It's very easy to get cat caught, caught here. Now, this is like fishing hook, can catch you. Very easy to get catch, caught. And then he goes on to explain more. And uh, he says here on the next page, because you are attached to the words of the sutra, you have missed the spirit of the text. So he said, you are attached to the word of the sutra. You have misinterpreted the Lord Buddha's dying instruction, which is perfect, profound, and complete. You may read the sutra a thousand times, but you will get no benefit from it. And at this, the monk Zhang, he suddenly attained great enlightenment. He heard that, he got great enlightenment. He attained a great awakening. This is difficult to understand, but this is a very, uh, if you clearly understand this, then you understand Six Patriarch way of teaching. This is a very uh, a deep, actually. He, then he wrote the poem, and his poem is very beautiful. He said, because I have attached to the idea the idea of impermanent, the Buddha said that it is permanent. If you don't understand that these are just expedient words, it's like picking up a pebble from a spring pool and calling it a gem. Without any effort of my own, Buddha nature already appears. If it wasn't for your teaching, I would not have attained this. So without any effort of our own, Buddha nature already appears. That means spring comes, the grass turns green by itself. When the summer comes along, the green grass is getting longer. In the fall, the grass, the green, the grass that was green turns yellow again. The winter, the no grass is growing. This means every season changing, changing by itself. This, we say, is the Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is not difficult. Buddha nature is all around us. We all have the Buddha nature. We all have Buddha nature. Only dogs don't have Buddha nature. That's what Joju said. <laughs> Why did the Jojo say dog have no Buddha nature? This you must find out. Okay. Then he said, now you are complete. 
From now on, you should call yourself Zi Che to realize thoroughly. Zi Che thanked the patriarch, bowed, and departed. Then he left. Okay. Then next, one day, a 13-year-old boy, Shen Wei, he arrived from another monastery to pay homage to the patriarch. And the patriarch said, my learned friend, it must be hard for you, a young boy, 13 years old, to undertake such a long journey. He asked him, you are 13 years old, you know? You are a young, very young boy. must be difficult for you to take such a long journey. Do you understand your original face? If you do know your owner, say something about it. If you understand your original face, which he meant your master, your original face, your master, your juingong. Do you understand your juingong? Or your Korean's original face is bolle, myeonmyeo. Do you understand that? And then the, the young, very young novice monk, he said, non-attachment is our original mind. Seeing that is the master. This is actually not bad. It's little, but too many words, too much of explanation. Sounds OK, but he said, non-attachment is our original mind. Seeing that is the master. Then the sixth patriarch, he scolded him. He said, novice monk, you know, sami sinim, novice monk, you are fit for nothing but loose talk. You are gab. You are the gab, blah, blah. You are gab. You are too gabby, he said. Then the Shen Wei asked the patriarch, in your meditation, sir, do you see your true nature or not? This is young, you know, young boy monk asked, do you see your true nature? He asked this great master, do you see your true nature or not? Most people think like this. <laughs> Many people I know, they think like that. Oh. In your meditation, do you see your master? Do you know yourself? Then the patriarch took his stick and hit him three times. And then he asked him, do you feel pain or not? And the Shen Wei said, pain and not pain. This is not a very good answer. If somebody hit you with a stick, how do you answer? Do you feel pain or not? What, how do you answer? Aya, aya, correct. Pain and not pain, that's uh, too many words. But the sixth patriarch, he said, I see and I see not. I see and I see not. Uh, this is also, OK, but we say also too many words. <laughs> Better is just say, ah, oh, your robe is a brown color, or your shirt is a purple, or the floor is a, is a beige. Very simple, direct, ex direct answer. But he said, I see and I see not. Then again, the young monk asked, how is it that you see and you see not? How can you see and you see not? Well, what I see are my own faults. What I do not see is the good and bad of others. That is why I see and I do not see. So he's giving some compassionate teaching. He gives some teaching about what I see are my own fault. I see my own mistake. But I don't see the good and bad of others. I don't judge others. This is a compassionate teaching. Now, please tell me. Again, he asked him, please tell me what you mean by pain and not pain. If you feel no pain, you would be like a piece of wood or stone. If the, on the other hand, if you feel pain, you are the same as an ordinary person who at the same time has anger and hatred. The seeing and not seeing you ask about are a pair of opposites, while pain and not pain belong to that which appears and disappears. 
without having realized your own true nature, you dare to fool others. Okay, so what he said was, the seeing and not seeing is okay. This is a pair of opposites that uh, we can use. But pain and not pain, this is a appearance and disappearance. So it's only explanation. You should not say pain and not pain. Did too much explain. Then he says, uh, then finally he says, you've dared to fool us. Then Shen Shui apologized and he bowed and he thanked the patriarch for his instruction. And then he said to him, the patriarch said, if you are under delusion, you cannot see your true nature, you should seek the advice of a good and learned friend. When you attain your mind, you will see your true nature. Yet you dare to ask me whether I see my true nature or not. If I do, I realize it myself, but this cannot help you from being under delusion. Similarly, if you see your true nature, your seeing would be of no use to me. Instead of asking others, why not see it for yourself and know it for yourself? So you'll see the sixth patriarch, he's a little bit scolding Kim. But uh, this is also good teaching for him. Then he bowed more than a hundred times. And the Shen Hui, he asked the patriarch for forgiveness. And he stayed on to be the patriarch's attendant. And one day, the uh, addressing the assembly, the patriarch said, I have one thing which has no head, no tail, no name, no word, no front, no back. Do any of you know it? Then Shen Wei came forward and he said, it's the source of all the Buddhas, Shen Wei's Buddha nature. He said, it's me, my Buddha nature. <laughs> Very arrogant. This is what we say, arrogant. Then, I've already told you that it's without name and word, and yet you call it the original source of Buddha nature. Even if you confine yourself to a small hut, a small hermitage, you will only be a le Zen lecturer. Does everybody know what a Zen lecturer is? That means that somebody who's teaching Zen uh, only academically, but not practicing it. In English, we say you must walk the talk. Everybody know what that means? This Korean people don't know. You must walk the talk. What does that mean? Walk the talk. That means if you talk big, then you must also big action. You must walk action. Your action and your speech must follow, must be together, not separate. If you talk, I am a great man. I am a great master. I am. Then your action also has to be like that. That's the point, okay? We say in English, you must walk the talk, okay? So the patriarch said, uh, you will only be a Zen lecturer. And after the patriarch died, the Shen Wei, he left for Luyang, where he spread the teaching of the Southern School wi widely. The Luyang is in the south, uh, near the Sorim, Nur, Sorim Shaolin Temple. And he wrote a popular book entitled An Expli Explicit Treatise on Diana Teaching. He was generally known by the name of Zen Master Heze, the name of his monastery. So he later became a Zen Master. And he spread the teaching wi widely. So the sixth patriarch, he later he saw that many questions were put to him in bad faith by followers of various schools and that a great number of such questioners had gathered around him. Seeing this, the patriarch, out of compassion, he addressed them and he said, if you want to learn the way, you should take away all your thinking, good and bad. When there are no longer names, that is your nature. The nature of non-duality is called true nature, and this is the basis of all teaching. One should realize their true nature as soon as it is mentioned. And after everybody heard this, everybody in the assembly bowed and asked the patriarch to allow them
to become his disciples. So uh, we see here that uh, even though maybe we don't understand some of these teachings, these teachings were very profound and they very deeply affected the people at that time. And uh, this was the basic uh, Zen teaching that later became very popular in China. After the Sixth Patriarch died, the Zen school became very big in China. We say golden age of Zen was the time in China because many, many people, they wanted to practice, they practiced Zen and they uh, learned from the uh, monks who were practicing. So we say the golden age of Zen because many common people uh, were able to uh, bring Zen into their everyday life. Okay, are there any questions? No questions? Everybody understand? Very well? Okay, very good. <laughs> now we just have to put it into practice. We just got to walk the talk. <laughs> All right, so uh, if we don't have any questions, then we'll finish for today. Okay, thank you for listening. And uh, next month, we will continue with uh, uh, Chapter 9. This is very uh, uh, near the finish of the book, actually. Maybe Chapter 9 and also a little of Chapter 10 is very long. So maybe Chapter 9 and part of Chapter 10. Okay, thank you all. Thank you.